Dallas under a deluge of rain that's a once in a millennial disaster. 15 inches of rain in 24 hours, leaving streets underwater and residents desperate for rescue. Dangerous droughts and flooding are also plaguing other parts of the south and the southwest. And the ominous rain is now heading for the east. Caitlin Burke reports. It's being called a once in a thousand years event, a slow moving storm system dropping record breaking rain on areas that haven't seen substantial rainfall all summer. Caught people off guard, but I think everybody wasn't anticipating this much rain this fast. The deluge brought Dallas, Texas to a standstill Monday, forcing motorists to abandon their vehicles and get off the roads before being swept away by flash flooding. Sunday to Monday, the city experiencing its highest 24-hour rainfall totals in 90 years. Weather stations reporting more than a foot of rain across the Dallas area. The current's so strong going past my house, you, you, it'll wash you away. The rapidly increasing water levels left many in dangerous situations. The floodwaters sweeping up vehicles and dumping them blocks away, backing up traffic. Some neighborhoods with virtual rivers running through their streets rescue teams pulling families to safety. Other parts of the Southwest experienced the monsoon rains over the weekend. In New Mexico's Carlsbad Caverns National Park, about 150 people had to be evacuated after being stranded for hours due to impassable roads. Never been this close to a flood before, me neither. In Utah, rescue workers at Zion National Park are still looking for 29-year-old Jaytel Agni Hotri of Tucson, who was hiking when floodwaters swept through the area. I mean, it's frustrating. It's already day three for us, and we haven't found any clue except the backpack. As residents work to dry out, clean up, and survey the damage, more rain is in the forecast. AccuWeather predicting another round of flooding downpours for those same south central states through Thursday. Caitlin Burke, CBN News. Those pictures in the video is hard to fathom. Think of that, the highest 24-hour rainfall in 90 years. Of course, we want to pray for the people affected by this and the first responders as they've also got family to care for themselves. Well, in other news, former President Donald Trump is escalating his fight over those confiscated documents. Ephraim Graham has that story and more from the CBN Newsroom. Ephraim. Andrew, the former president's legal team filed a motion for the FBI to stop going through the documents and requesting a special master to review and identify any that don't fall under the search warrant or are protected by executive or attorney client privilege. This comes as media reports now claim Trump had more than 300 classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. 150 were returned to the National Archives in January. Another batch turned over to the Justice Department in May, the rest seized in the raid. The Department of Justice has until Monday to deliver a redacted version of the affidavit the warrant is based on. The judge does acknowledge the redactions could make be so extensive that it renders the document useless. The midterm elections are still months away, but some are already looking ahead to the 2024 vote. Big names are stumping for congressional candidates while building national support towards a possible presidential run. White House correspondent Abigail Robertson reports. Former Vice President Mike Pence raised eyebrows at the Iowa State Fair over the weekend, leading to further speculation he's planning a 2024 presidential run. I'm in Iowa for one reason and one reason only, and that is that Iowa and America need six more years of Senator Chuck Grassley. Pence claims his current focus is helping GOP candidates win back the House and Senate, and he'll assess future plans next year. After the first of the year, my family and I will do as we've always done, and that is reflect and pray on where we might next serve, where we might next contribute. But today, it's all about winning back the Congress and re-electing Senator Chuck Grassley. Pence also hinted he's open to testifying before the January 6th committee. But if they present a, a formal invitation for the committee, I've said we'll give it due consideration. But we'll do so reflecting on the unique responsibilities that I have to defend the prerogatives of my office as vice president. Congresswoman Liz Cheney told ABC News's Jonathan Carl she hopes he does. When the country has been through something as grave as this was, uh, everyone who has information has an obligation to step forward. So uh, I would hope that, that he will do that. Fresh off a of primary loss, Cheney's considering her own presidential bid and vows to stop former President Donald Trump from winning again. 
I think we have to make sure that he is not our nominee. We have no chance at winning elections if we are in a position where our party has uh, abandoned principle and abandoned value and abandoned fundamental fidelity to the Constitution in order to embrace a cult of personality. Trump holds a substantial lead in 2024 GOP primary polls, with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis consistently a distant second place. Aren't you glad to live in a free state? And on the Democratic side... I don't think he would win. I don't, I don't think a lot of people are happy with him. Voters in Iowa, an early primary state, are casting doubt on a second term for President Biden. I, I think there's probably some other candidates that would get some fresh blood in there. Even though recent polls show most Democrats would prefer a new candidate to run in 2024, Biden reportedly plans to launch his re-election campaign after the midterms, opening the door for a possible rematch with former President Donald Trump. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Abigail, thank you. I want to update you now on the car bomb that killed the daughter of an advisor to President Vladimir Putin. Russia claims a female Ukrainian spy used remote control to set off the explosive that killed 29-year-old Daria Dugina. It is widely believed her father was the intended target. Ukraine, backed by the U.S. State Department, calls the Russian claim a complete fake. U.S. intelligence warning of retaliatory attacks by Russia, banning public events on Ukraine's Independence Day this Wednesday. Turning now to Israel in a discovery with biblical significance, a unique stone from an unearthed synagogue where Jesus likely prayed is now back in its home in Galilee. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl shows us why the Magdala stone is so special. One, two, and three. Deemed by experts as one of Israel's most important discoveries, the Magdala Stone spent years with the Israel Antiquities Authority, then went on an international tour with showings in New York and Rome. I myself, with some other workers here, put in the truck that uh, remove it from the site. So I, I said, bye, see you soon <laughs> to the stone in, at the beginning of January 2010. To see the stone coming back today is a big joy. In 2009, archaeologists excavating here uncovered the original Magdala stone. This replica stands in the exact location where they found it. The director of the Antiquities Authority at the time of the discovery, he came, he was looking around, he said, the Magdala stone has to come back here because this synagogue without the stone is like a beheaded body. Known today as Migdal, Magdala was a city on the Sea of Galilee and known as the home of Mary Magdalene. In 2005, Father Juan Solana initiated the Magdala project to highlight Jesus' ministry in the region and honor women of faith. They broke ground in 2009 and the center now includes an archaeological park, a chapel, and a hotel on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. When I was about to buy the land at the very beginning, I thought it cannot belong to the Catholic Church, but all Christians, because Magdala as a hometown of Mary Magdalene is a treasure for all Christians. But when we discovered the synagogue and the entire town of Magdala from the first century, it said it belongs not to all Christians, but also to the Jewish people. Magdala stone is an unicum. It's a unique object. It is an unknown collection of what I think to be Jewish symbolism, which symbolized the temple in Jerusalem. Archaeologist Mordechai Aviam believes the stone held deep meaning for Jewish worshipers who couldn't make the weeks-long trek to Jerusalem and back. They looked at the stone, they felt Jerusalem and the temple and God in their hearts, and that's the meaning of this stone. My angle on Magdala are the people who come. So I'm always engaging the people who come, and really a cross-section of humanity comes here. And we say that the archaeology here is a crossroads of Jewish and Christian history, but that the spirit of Magdala is a crossroads for everybody. Father Kelly says he believes the return of the original stone will draw people like a magnet. Magdala is like an oasis of encounter. So here we have a great spirit of encounter, and I think this is going to give that further impulse because people will come, and this will create conversation, dialogue, and quest for understanding and that will be an opening to understanding the past and the present and that's a pathway for the future. 
Julie Stahl, CBN News, Magdala, Israel. I feel that magnet pulling, Andrew. All right, Ephraim, we want to thank Julie Stahl and Chris Mitchell and the great news team we have in Israel and the Holy Land who bring us those stories. By the way, on a different note, I want to thank all of you who have emailed us and called CBN, checking on Gordon, seeing how he's doing. Gordon is taking some well-deserved time off. Well-deserved. And the fall's a busy time here at CBN, so he's just recharging a bit, and he will be back in early September. So thanks to those of you who have checked on him. He's doing well. She was given four weeks to live. 46-year-old Michelle Tucker was told to go home and put her affairs in order. Instead, she refused to give up. She turned to a small Christian hospital in Mexico that's been treating patients like Michelle for 60 years. George Thomas takes us to Tijuana, Mexico for a firsthand look at the Oasis of Hope. August 2017, Michelle Tucker remembers the words from that day in the doctor's office as her oncologist delivered the news. I was told I had about four weeks to live, to go home and get my affairs in order. The 46-year-old mother of three had battled cancer since she was 19. It started in her breast, first spreading to her thyroid and then pancreas. I figured I would take my children maybe to the beach for the first week of those four weeks and just sit on the beach. But at the same time, I had the attitude of like, who are you to tell me my expiration date? There's only one person that can do that, and that's not a doctor. No offense to medicine. That's the men upstairs. In desperation, she researched alternative cancer treatments and ended up here at the Oasis of Hope Hospital. If you get diagnosed with cancer, you're not going to travel to Tijuana, Mexico. But when they have reached a point where the doctor is saying, we really can't do anything else for you, this is a typical person that comes to Oasis of Hope. 25 miles south of San Diego and just across the Mexican border, Tucker believes God is using Oasis of Hope to give her a chance to continue living. From the moment that you walk in the doors, you feel this overwhelming spiritual presence. There's the pastor that sings with you. They pray with you. You're, you become a family. Tucker has been in remission now for two years. Oasis of Hope was started in 1963 by the late Mexican doctor Ernesto Contreras Sr., who believed in taking a holistic approach to fighting cancer. His son, Dr. Francisco Contreras, now serves as the hospital's president. Uh, my father felt that the, you know, the reason for the failure in oncology and medicine overall is that we have become just mechanics of the human body. So the idea for Oasis of Hope originated back in the early 1960s when Contreras' father decided to go on a missions trip to Greece. And on that trip, he discovered three important elements that are today at the core of the hospital. Contreras says while traditional oncology focuses on destroying the tumor, his father, a physician, wanted the hospital to focus on the patient's emotional renewal, spiritual revival, as well as physical restoration. The founder's grandson, Daniel Kennedy, serves as the hospital's CEO. So there is no other clinic in Tijuana that actually has a pastor on the payroll, praying for patients every day, opening with uh, praise and worship. Ernesto Lopez is that pastor. He used to lead a local church in Tijuana. Now he walks the corridors of the hospital, ministering to the spiritual and emotional needs of patients. Yeah, seen a, lot of miracles. a lot of miracles, miracles of healing, miracles of salvation. Using a combination of conventional treatments with alternative therapies, such as whole body hypothermia, ozone therapy, and dendritic cell vaccine immunotherapy, Oasis of Hope says it has treated more than 100,000 cancer patients from 60 countries. The majority come from the United States because we're just across the border from San Diego. So you're in charge of everything that lands on a patient's table here mm -hmm. at Oasis. Mm -hmm. Rosa Tesada is the hospital's nutritionist. Working with kitchen staff, Tesada has designed a cancer-fighting plant-based food program to help patients live a healthier life. 90% of the meals served here are vegan-based. 
Okay, so we don't want to make anybody feel like you have to leave your old life back. Just let's add some new, you know, more greens, more vegetables, mm -hmm. and then just kind of enjoy food and go along with it. The hospital grows vegetables on its rooftop garden and teaches patients how to prepare healthy meals. So what we do is help them to see, hey, you can make very healthy dishes mm. very fast and very easy. There remain several opinions on this alternative approach and others. For example, the American Cancer Society states some complementary methods have generally not been proven to help prevent or treat cancer or its symptoms. It recommends discussing any treatment patients might consider with their doctor or cancer team. While doctors at Oasis of Hope are proud to share success stories like Kayla's, Michelle's and others, they point out not all patients who come here will make it. Still, Dr. Contreras believes all deserve to be treated with compassion and the love of Christ. I believe that hope is a very powerful uh, uh, tool and that all patients should, should have hope. Contreras says what he, along with his team of doctors, nurses, nutritionists, pastors and counselors, are negotiating for is more time for patients. I cannot guarantee anything. I cannot guarantee anything for myself. The only thing that I can guarantee is that I'm going to sit with you and I'm going to do everything possible and I'm going to negotiate with you for life. And God will decide yes, no, or maybe. George Thomas, CBN News, Tijuana, Mexico. Well, there's hardly a one of us who does not love somebody that has battled cancer or maybe is or, you know, so many people we love are touched by this horrible condition. We're grateful for places like the Oasis of Hope. If you'd like more information on the Oasis of Hope, you can just go to CBNnews.com. And, you know, Terry and I later in this program are going to be praying. We're going to be praying for you. And if you're facing cancer, we'd like to take the time later in this show to be praying for you. So stay with us, Terry. A 20% chance of survival. That's all the hope doctors had for Heather Hughes when she made it to the trauma center. Heather had blood in her abdomen from a liver laceration, along with a host of other life-threatening injuries. And before long, her 20% chance of survival shrank to zero. First responders arrive at a single car accident in Octibaha County, Mississippi. A Jeep had run off the road and flipped several times, throwing three occupants from the vehicle. Two were confirmed dead. One, 26-year-old Heather Hughes, showed barely any signs of life. They were not very sure that she was alive. And then as I got to her, I realized that she did have a pulse and uh, we were able to work on her. Paramedic Stuart Bird and crew rushed Heather to a local hospital. Someone there who knew the family called Heather's mom, Ann, with the news. She said, Ann, Heather's been in a car wreck and it don't look good. I immediately started praying and said, God, you can't let her die. Later, she and her husband, Jean, arrived to find medical staff still fighting to save their daughter. When I walked through the emergency room doors and she was on that stretcher, and they were working on her and the bone was sticking out here. She was real bloody. They had a tube down her mouth and into her throat and she was just bad. Heather suffered numerous fractures, a broken neck, and was bleeding internally from her liver and lungs. Needing advanced care, she was put in a medically induced coma and medevac to a level two trauma center in Tupelo, Mississippi. I kissed her on the head, told her I loved her, hang in there. They uh, went ahead and got her to Tupelo and we came on up. On the way to Tupelo with Jean, Ann called friends and a Christian radio station asking for prayer. I called WFCA and he put it out on the radio and then people that I had not gotten up with found out about it. We just prayed that God would work a mighty work in Heather. Heather made it to North Mississippi Medical Center alive, where Dr. Robert McCulley and his team were waiting. There was only a 20% chance she would live. And she had blood uh, in her abdominal cavity. She was bleeding from a liver laceration. The blood we gave her would just bleed right back out. I didn't think she was going to survive. When Ann and Jean arrived an hour later, 
they went in to see Heather. She was stabilized, but doctors had offered little hope. I said, I don't think she's going to make it, Gene. And he looked at me, and he said, Ann, where is your faith? Ann found a quiet place in the hospital to be alone and pray. I said, God, you gave her to me. And if you want her back, then you can have her. But I sure wish you would leave her with me for a while longer. But again, if you think this is what you want, then give me the strength to go through it. And I felt such a peace come over me that I didn't question it anymore. It's just somehow I knew she was going to be all right. But holding on to that faith would be tested when Heather's vitals crashed again. I got a call that her pressure was 58 over 30, and her oxygen saturations were back low again, so we're going to lose her. It's probably approaching 100%. Anne continued to believe God for a miracle. I would just look at them and say, she's going to be fine. And I know they really thought I was either in shock or crazy. But I know what God had given me when I prayed, so I wasn't in doubt at all. After several hours, Dr. McCulley got her stabilized, but he was still unable to offer encouragement. Even if we get her through the next 72 hours and she stabilizes, then we still have to worry about ARDS, shock lung, and sepsis, and infections developing. More family members began to arrive as word continued spreading for people to pray. Heather remained stabilized, and two weeks later was well enough to be brought out of her coma. I had to just shout and tell everybody. <laughs> She's a fighter, and I knew that if, if she could get her sense about her, she would pull through this with flying colors, which is what she did. Three months after the accident, Heather was released. With rest, rehab, and prayer, she began to heal, thankful for God's miracle. It's surreal, really cool how prayer worked and faith just holding on to his promise, thanking God that I made it. Even in this mess, I've, I've made it. By all accounts, Heather's recovery is nothing short of miraculous. Her lungs were collapsed, liver bleeding, the pain in her legs, and her every rib broken, clavicle broken. You know she couldn't. I mean, she shouldn't be alive. That's a good miracle. Today, Heather is married and works as a nurse. She says God has healed her physically, emotionally, and spiritually. She and her family know as well as anyone what is possible through the power of prayer. And I know he hears me, and he's answered multiple, multiple prayers since this event in my life. And so it just makes him more real. I mean, it's just constant seeing God's hand work through every bit of this. And it's, it's God. It's not any of us. You know, there comes a point, I think, when we are all joining together and praying for each other where you just embrace trust in the middle of the situation and you let God do what he does best. Many of you today are struggling with all kinds of things. Some, some of you certainly not physical. Some of you are dealing with financial issues, some relationship issues. God knows you. He knows you by name. He hears your prayers. He invites us all to come together to come together and to approach him. And there is a power in that when we unite and we come and we come in his name. And so we want to do that with you today for whatever it is you're struggling with in your own walk, in your own life. We do have some other answers to prayer. This is Heather. She wrote by email. She said, on August 19th, Andrew Knox gave a word from the Lord about a woman crying about her son going to college. In that very hour, I'd been walking the college campus with my son, trying to hold back tears to stay strong for him. When I got back to my rented room and was watching the 700 Club pre-recorded, I was tearful. That's when the word came and I knew it was for me. I began to have peace and fear subsided. God reminded me through the words of encouragement by Andrew that my son is in good hands, God's hands. God will continue to provide, protect, and lead my son. I was able to say goodbye, to fly back home and keep my composure so that my son didn't have to feel guilt, worry, or sadness for stepping out in faith toward what God has called him to do. 
Thank you, 700 Club, for demonstrating the power of prayer and to Andrew for his courage to step out and speak as God led him. Amen. Amen. It's wonderful. That's so sweet. I, I, God. Yeah. I was praying that and thinking, Lord, this is very unusual. Yes. And, um, yes, it is. Our God can I be remember. unusual. Yes. yes. Usually. <laughs> <laughs> Usually he's unusual. <laughs> and he's faithful. Here's another yes. uh, great report. This is Susan by email. I was healed of arthritis in both of my shoulders wow. when Terry prayed regarding someone with arthritis. Mm. I praise the Lord for his healing power. I'm totally pain free. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray now. It's mm -hmm. our privilege to pray for you. And so many of you write us and call us and say, this is our favorite time of the program when you pray for the audience. Please do it more. We want to do it for you now. So please join with us. Lord God, we're humbled to be in your presence, and we know we have audience with you, Father, through Jesus, and we thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Lord, we saw that story earlier about cancer, people and families dealing with cancer diagnosis. Right now, I want to pray for the caregivers of those who are battling cancer, for energy, for supernatural emotional mm -hmm. strength upon these caregivers who are weary and tired. In the name of Jesus, just give them a power and strength they didn't know they could have. And for those facing cancer now, of course, Lord God, we pray for healing. We rebuke cancer in the name of Jesus. Right now, if you have cancer or you've just received a diagnosis, you're battling this. Lord, we know you battle with those who trust in you. We're not going to be fearful. We're not going to be dismayed. You are our God. Lord God, we just pray for healing now. Whatever the cancer diagnosis, whatever part of the body, whatever condition, in the name of Jesus, we rebuke it. Thank you, Lord, for your healing power and your presence with us in Jesus' name. There's someone, you have an odd, um, it's like a fungus in your fingernails, and it's around the base of your nail, and it's so unsightly. I mean, it's actually like eating away at your nails. It's an odd color. You're ashamed of your hands. God is healing that condition for you right now. Lift up those hands and begin to praise him as he delivers you from this. There's a woman who just can't get the thought out of her head of the door slamming behind her husband who walked out. And she's just in despair. And God says, I'm enough for you. Even when it doesn't seem like it each day, I am enough. And he's going to work in your marriage, what's left of it. Mm -hmm. But most importantly, he wants you to know he is enough for you. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yeah, someone else, you have an issue with your sinuses. I don't know what's happened in the past, if you've had surgery or if it's just that they're deteriorating. Your face is kind of misshapen under your eye and by your nose because of this condition that you've had for a long time. God's healing that for you right now. No, there will be no more surgeries, no more procedures done. Just begin to breathe clearly. Even though one part of that sinus cavity is affected, you're going to breathe clearly and everything will be well again in Jesus' name. Yeah, the, a breathing issue. There's a woman with an infant, and the, the baby's even been checked out by a doctor. They don't understand this coughing that's consistently going on, and the Lord's going to heal this little precious one right now of that cough in the name of Jesus. You're just going to stop hearing it. Thank you, Lord God, for infusing this infant with life mm. and clear lungs and breathing power in Jesus' name. As someone else, you have uncontrollable high blood pressure. You have taken multiple medications. Your doctor is stumped by all of this, but all of you are concerned. Uh, God's healing that condition for you right now. Just exhale and then lift your hands and begin to praise him. You are being set free from that. Someone praying for an alcoholic son, mm -hmm. and you're in such despair over the choices he's making. Just this alcohol has consumed his life. And the Lord just says, I have him. Just keep praying. Keep praying. Yeah. Praying mother is powerful. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe that message is for a number of praying mothers who are so concerned and desperate, as Andrew said, for your children who are lost. Let it go. Put them on the altar. God has them. Out of the mess comes the, the message. Mm. And God will do that for your child as you trust him for it. Just begin to thank him and trust him for what he's in the process of already doing. Someone praying for miracles, someone praying for the the ability to pray for miracles. And it's like, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief, as the scripture says. And God's just saying, the power is in me. It's in the Lord. It's not in you. It's through the Lord that the miraculous happens. So keep your eyes focused on Jesus. He is the source. Thank you, Lord.
Thank you. Father, we thank you for meeting with us today and for all of those who are praying earnestly and crying out, Lord. We just pray they hear the sweet sound of your voice, mighty in power in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've received a miracle or you want further prayer, you can call us at 800-700-7000. We'd love to hear from you and we would love to pray for you. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Pfizer is seeking FDA authorization for a COVID booster that protects against new variants. The new shot developed to address not only the original virus, but also the BA4 and BA5 strains. BA5 is causing most of the COVID infections in the United States right now. If the agency approves, the new shot could be available within weeks. Moderna is expected to follow suit with its own application for an updated booster shot. The head of the nation's top infectious disease agency is retiring. Dr. Anthony Fauci announcing he'll step down in December. He currently serves as head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, as well as White House chief medical advisor. Fauci became the focus of nationwide praise and criticism during the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. When the housing market crashed, Chris Birch was hit hard. He stopped getting paid. He started to feel the pressure. Still, Chris stayed the course and increased his business 10 times. As the co-founder of Grand Bay Construction, Chris Birch builds vacation homes and properties across the tourist town of Santa Rosa Beach, Florida. This is a big tourist destination. I had plans to, you know, build a big construction company it was my plan. And uh, I had some partners. But within two years, the housing market began to crash, and Chris and his financial partners quickly felt the pressure. Prices in real estate were uh, being dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, and owners defaulted and couldn't pay us, so we were sort of left um, with a lot of obligations financially that we couldn't keep going. I didn't panic, but it, it, was, uh, it was sort of like, okay, you know, what's going on? You know, look, we got a storm coming. Chris is a Christian and has been a faithful tither since his mid-20s. But with his business struggling, Chris had to decide if he should stop giving. The Lord has taken care of me all these years. Even things have been tight. You know, why would I not trust his word? And why would I just borrow from him or steal from him or whatever you want to say? I'm, uh, and so I said, I'm not going to do that. To show the Lord that I really do believe him and I really trust him, I'm going to actually give more than I'm giving now, even though, again, my income is going down. And it wasn't a lot, but I, this was something I just felt like the Lord said, just, you know, just trust me with this. At the end of 12 months, Chris was amazed at what happened to his finances. I had paid off my graduate school loans, which, which, which was pretty amazing. And I had saved more money in that one year than I had in the previous five years combined. Again, you know, God's economy just doesn't work the way ours does. There's no way I can explain that besides him just saying, you trusted in me and I'm going to provide for you. His construction business survived the recession. In the years since, Chris has seen even more incredible growth. So from those days when we first got started, I mean, I don't know the exact numbers, but I would say we're probably close to almost 10 times um, in volume sales of what we were doing back then. Chris continues to tie that also gives time and money to ministries that serve those in need, like CBN. Operation Blessings and all those type things, I really believe in those kind of things. I'm trying to do that as well, but I love uh, being part of a bigger organization that's doing those things and is changing the world and bringing light to, to the darkness. He's increased the business, and in turn, we, we take a portion of our business and we turn that back into the kingdom, whether it's buying Bibles or um, we've got uh, mission products all over the world where we're helping spread the gospel. According to Chris, the key to overcoming financial strain is following God's financial principles. If you do what God asks you to do, He will give you this peace and He will provide a way. Even when, like in my case, there was no way it worked on paper. And all these things that looked horrible um, I've turned out better. Everything has turned out better. And, and he's proven to me that he, he'll take care of me even through those difficult times. We appreciate Chris sharing his story with us. You know, I hope that serves as an encouragement to you if you're going through a financial challenge right now. So many people in this country are. Here's a gentleman who, is, who, who said he was earning less, but he decided to give God more even though his income had decreased. That takes a lot of courage and trust, but he learned he could trust God. 
Three back-to-back -back deployments within five years. After this grueling duty, former Navy SEAL Brian Heffy was ready to retire from the military. So why did he head to the wilderness of Alaska to live where every day is a struggle just to survive? And what lessons can we learn from his biggest challenges? See for yourself. At fewer than two people per square mile, Alaska boasts the lowest population density in the country. And for people like Brian Heafy, that's one of the biggest reasons to live here. After graduating from the Naval Academy and a successful career as a U.S. Navy SEAL, Heafy needed a change of pace. The deployments are six months long, and uh, I did three back-to-back -back deployments. I felt very fortunate to still be alive at the end of those five years. So after resigning his commission, Heafy went back to his childhood passion, the great outdoors. I was very blessed to be able to grow up in a rural area. You know, that was always my draw, to the outdoors, to the wilderness. Heafy took a job as a river guide in Alaska and loved the wide open spaces and the challenges of living off grid. And his military experience serves him well when he's on his own in the backcountry. Preparation, self-discipline, learning to form realistic goals according to the time that you have available. Chores like this are a standard part of life out here in the Alaskan wilderness. But this is not a pastime or fitness. This is survival. The problem is it comes with its own set of risks because if you get hurt out here, it's a long way to the nearest hospital. And that means you've got to be extra careful and very meticulous about everything you do. Where I live now, a little mistake at 60 degrees below zero in the dark can turn into a life-threatening scenario, and it does. Some people call it Murphy's Law, I call it the law of opposition, you know. There's, there's always things working against you. And survival is all about making the best use of the resources you have available. But getting away from civilization doesn't equate to a stress-free life. There's always more to do than time to do it. Living here in a very austere environment, one of the most unforgiving environments on the planet, I would consider, because of the cold and the darkness and the rapid change of season, you begin to learn and focus on economy of time. There's only so many hours in the day. It does add a sense of urgency and intensity and reveals to you what really is important, what really does matter. And a lot of what goes on in the world doesn't matter. Living out in such vast country, you realize how small you are and vulnerable and fragile. Learning to move with purpose, to form a, a careful plan with each strike of an ax. I'd rather do something well once than have to go back and do it twice when I've got other things to do. With all the dangers he's confronted in 20 years living in the bush, Hefe has discovered that nature isn't the biggest threat he faces. The greatest danger to me is me if I'm not disciplined and I don't keep God in first place in my life. It, it's as simple as that. Brian has learned that by living an intentional life, every chore can become a spiritual act of worship. Getting wood, hauling water, cooking, cleaning, keeping ahead of the seasonal changes, uh, making sure you're stocked up, exercising your body, which isn't too hard to, <laughs> hard to do. But I think my life would best be described as the perfection of vital activity. That's what I engage in. How can I become better at any given task at any time to become more efficient, more safe, more productive? And there's a joy in that. Brian has taken the lessons he's learned living off the grid and put them into devotional form, both with scripture-based greeting cards containing his own photography and in his new book, Crystal Vision. It's for believers and non-believers alike to consider eternal things. Ironically, one of the biggest lessons he's learned spending years by himself is the importance of fellowship. It's good and instructive to have a getaway where you can draw nearer to God, focus on Him, pray that He'll reveal more of His character and to reveal more of His wisdom. But there's no wisdom to having a stay-away lifestyle. You're not part of the solution. You don't grow. You know, fellowship is a huge part of the Christian walk. Uh, we're strengthened by our brothers and sisters, and if they're true friends and brothers and sisters, they're gonna help point out where we might be slipping a little bit, where there may be sin in our life that we don't notice. My initial purpose in going outside and striking out on my own and, 
in developing this life. I had a general idea of what I wanted, but you know, there's that old saying, make your plans in pencil and give God the eraser. I'm so thankful he took that eraser and rearranged some of my priorities, but it all worked together beautifully. I want to let you know Brian has a great book. It is called Crystal Vision, and it's available online. You can also go to his website, brianhafey.com, and pick it up there. It's a great devotional book. You know, I'm fascinated with Brian's story, not just because I would like to think I could go live in the wilderness in Alaska and survive, which we all know would be an impossibility. <laughs> uh, but I feel like, you know, in some ways, our lives are not totally different than Brian's in the sense of we're not battling minus 60 degree weather in the dark, but sometimes we're our own worst enemy, aren't we? And what's really important? What are we prioritizing? There's so many distractions out there in Brian's life, which is a very unique life, and he's got challenges we don't have. but. He needs to make sure everything is attended to. His life depends on it. And you know, it made me think about Proverbs 24, where the writer of Proverbs says, he went past the field of the lazy man, past the vineyard of the one who wasn't caring for it. And what he saw was thorns growing and weeds overtaking the property and the stone wall crumbling. It was in rubble. And it's a great illustration for us of what, what has God called us to steward? What's in our hand? Maybe husbands have their marriage and their children and their jobs, and we all have our own responsibilities, our own areas of stewardship God has given us to tend to. And what does it look like? Is it finally manicured or are weeds growing? Is there rubble? It's, you know, seeing Brian's story is a great time for us to reflect on how am I tending to what God has given me? How am I keeping important what's really important? And, uh, you know, there's great lessons to be learned. Again, his book is called Crystal Vision. I encourage you to get a copy of it. And Terry, in our final moments here, we got a little over three minutes. I think we've got some email questions. We do have some email questions. This first one comes from Caitlin, who says, Hi, I'm a freshman in high school, and my question is, what advice or scripture would you give me as I go into this new stage of my life? Thanks. Boy, Caitlin, I think it's remarkable that you're asking this. Uh, <laughs> Seriously. Mm -hmm. Because I think that when you move from eighth grade into high school, that is a very big transition. And I was just listening to someone teaching yesterday about the fact that so many of us, so many people operate out of feeling a lack of, like I'm, I'm not enough, I'm not this, I don't have that. And then we begin to look for external things to validate who we are instead of understanding how loved we are by God. And you know, I would, I would say to you, stay, get close to Jesus. Look for where you can make a difference in the lives of fellow students, and and don't don't just go through it without thinking. Yeah. You know, go th and your question indicates you're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. Do it, th live thoughtfully, and yeah. ask God how He's going to use yeah. you. Yeah, great insight. I think too, like comparison is so damaging oh, yes. at any Goodness. age. When yeah. we compare ourselves to others, it leads to anxiety. I mean, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it, and especially in the high school yeah. years. I know this is all easy in principle, but it's difficult to live out. But when we compare ourselves to friends or people on social media, that's where anxiety really starts. So, so do your best not to compare yourself to other people. Stay rooted in the Word of God. Also, just to, on a practical level, realize the digital footprint is forever. Yeah. Social media, what you say on social media, what you comment on, pictures you post, um, that stuff is there forever. So be wise and discerning as much as you can, not to just type something in, send it out. Um, also, um, I, I talked to someone in high school about this, and uh, the conversation basically went, as much as you can, don't lower your standards to find acceptance. I know that's hard. High school, the peer pressure, there's joy and fun in high school, and then there's really tough, lonely times too. But looking back, I think a lot of us would say, you know, we, we wished we hadn't on occasion lower, lowered our standards just to fit in. Um, and, you know, as far as Scripture, the, the Word of God is just a treasure trove of what you will need in the moment, and you'll never be disappointed. I mean, His Word is a light to our path. Um, and and like you said, that the fact that she's asking this question, yeah. the Spirit of God is in her and working. You're good, Caitlin. Yeah. <laughs> You're good. You're Be good. encouraged. Yeah, belonging's highly overrated. Okay. <laughs> this is Melissa who says, I have a desire to be married. I'm in my mid-40s and have never been married. I've been praying for a long time. I know everything happens in God's perfect timing. Do you think I should just wait upon the Lord or join a Christian dating site? The only thing I would say is the question is, should I just wait upon the Lord or 
yeah. join a Christian dating site. Maybe that's just the way it was phrased. But if it's one or the other, you want to wait upon the Lord. But I don't think there's anything wrong with a dating site, right? Yeah. As long as you're discerning, yeah. cautious, and know there's a lot of strange people. Well, you out know, there. The, the thing about sites, any site, is they can make it look as great as they yeah. want it to be. They can present themselves. Sometimes, sometimes the picture isn't even really them. Or 25 years <laughs> yeah, previous. Whatever. You know? So be very careful yeah. if you're going to do that, yeah. and don't commit to anything. But is it? A, I mean, some people say, is it a sin, the dating site? Yeah, no, you just no. got to be really careful, yeah. of course. And keep telling God that you're waiting yeah. on Him, that you know He's got a plan for your life and that you want His yeah. plan. Well, and think of all the bad relationships that may have been avoided by waiting yes. on the Lord. Too. Yes. Hey, we leave you today with these words from Romans chapter 5. God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Terry and I thank you for being with us. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.